Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service. Welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar, part of our series of adult programs delivered differently. This morning, thanks to Fremantle Press, we welcome author Stella Rodriguez live via webinar as she discusses her book about the Alice Mitchell trial that gripped the nation, the Edward Street Baby Farm. Stella was born in England, but has lived in Western Australia for most of her life. She has worked as a general practitioner, pastoral carer, addictions clinic doctor, and a freelance writer. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for Stella into the Q&A or chat feeds on your screen, and I will ask these at the end of her talk. Now, please sit back, grab a cuppa, and please welcome special guest, Stella Rodriguez. Am I on? Thank you, Tracy. You are on. Thank you, That's Stella. Good. Yeah, thank you. So I'm very excited to be here this morning talking to you from Perth, where it's eight o'clock in the morning. So if I seem a little dopey, I'm waiting for the caffeine to kick in. Adelaide is one of my favourite cities for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the uh, Wajip Noongar people who are the custodians of the land around Perth. As I've been researching um, local history, I've come to realise how dark that history has been for most Aboriginal people. And um, I have great respect for the endurance that they've shown, the resilience and their determination to produce a better future for their children. Um, as Tracy said, this morning I'm going to be discussing this book, The Edward Street Baby Farm. But before I do that, I'd like to discuss my first book, which was this one, Susan, because it was quite important in coming to write the Edward Street book. Back in 2015, I just retired from medical work. Um, I was trying to decide what I should do and I woke up one morning and decided I was going to write a book about Susan Mason, my great-great-grandmother. I'd been researching her history for many years, 10 years at least, and had written several articles about her for my family history blog, but I felt that I wanted to bring it all together. I found her quite fascinating because she was so different than me. She was um, illiterate. She was a very feisty lady who often finished up in court because she got into people, but sometimes took people to court because she was insulted by what they'd said to her. And she was also the mother of 14 children, which is rather more than my two. So I started writing that book. It took me a lot longer than I imagined it would because although I'd done a lot of research, I started trying to put it all together. I found that I had a lot of gaps that needed filling. But by 2017, I'd got a reasonably long book together. I was feeling quite pleased with myself, but I didn't think that it was the sort of book that a publisher would want to pick up, a story by an unknown author about an unknown woman. So I self-published that one. But the reason I'm telling you all about this is that Susan was born in Adelaide, that's my Adelaide connection, and she, um, she was the child of Irish parents and at the age of 19, having had a fairly rough upbringing, she um, became a single mother. She became pregnant to a, a, an English soldier named David Ibrew. The baby was born, she was named Harriet, and then Three months later, Susan was pregnant again to the same soldier, and this time they got married. And when the when David's regiment went back to England, Susan went with him, taking the second baby, but leaving Harriet behind, which seemed very strange. And so I started researching what happened to the children of single mothers in those days. I knew that it was a great shame to be um, a mother without being married. And I discovered that they were generally encouraged to give up their children. In fact, if they weren't from a wealthy family, they had no option because they needed to go back to work to earn a living to themselves. There was no social security. 
there was no formal adoption or fostering process either, but many, um, many women found someone to take the child for a fee, either a, a lump sum if the person was agreeing to adopt the child or, or a regular payment if they were fostering it. But as is common in human nature, if there was somebody with a need, there were people willing to exploit that. And so that was where baby farming began, that there were people who would take in um, children from single mothers with no interest in the children at all. It was just the money they wanted. And they would maximise their profit by taking in as many children as they could. They, they would neglect the children. In some cases where lump sum um, payments were involved, they would actually dispose of the children in some way or another in order to increase their profits. In fact, there were several very notorious cases in Britain and in Australia um, at the end of the 19th century. Fortunately, Susan seems to have left her daughter Harriet with family or friends because when Harriet was in her teens, she joined the family in England. So um, that was fortunate for her. But when I'd finished writing the book, I still had this base baby farming in mind and I thought, I'd look it up and find out more about it. I thought maybe I could write a blog article about it. And so I went on Google and I was quite startled to discover that one of the most notorious baby farmers in Australia was a lady named Alice Mitchell, who had been um, sent for trial for murder in Perth in 1907. I found this intriguing because I've lived in Perth all my life and I'd never heard anything about it before. Everybody I've mentioned it to had never heard of it before either. I found newspaper articles and a few articles online that gave me the basic outline of the story. A young woman named Elizabeth Booth had had a child at the um, House of Mercy, which was a, a non on denominational home for fallen women. And she stayed there for three months, but then she had to leave as was the rules and she needed to work. And so quite reluctantly, she took her baby to Alice Mitchell who was licensed by the Perth City Council to take in babies for a fee. And um, Elizabeth agreed to pay Alice 10 shillings a week, which was quite a large proportion of her 15 shillings a week that she would earn as a domestic servant. Over the next few weeks, Elizabeth visited her baby Ethel as often as she could. But Alice started making excuses for not letting her see the baby. And when Elizabeth finally did see Ethel, she was quite horrified at how unwell she was. And after an, a tip off from the police, she took the baby to the hospital where unfortunately she died the following day. There was an autopsy and the doctors who did that decided that Ethel had died of um, starvation and neglect. So the police who'd already had an eye on Alice Mitchell arrested her for the murder of Ethel and at the subsequent, there was an inquest first and then there was a trial and the police alleged at the trial that Alice had had 43 babies in her care over the previous six years, most of them the children of single mothers, but not all. And of those, 37 had died. I won't go into the full details of what happened to Alice, that's in the book, but this really intrigued me. And I wanted to know more about the people involved. Who was this Alice Mitchell? Where did she come from? There was also a, um, a doctor named Dr. Officer who had signed two thirds of the death certificates and hadn't made any sort of effort to notify anybody about the high death rate. There was a health inspector, Harriet Lenahan, who visited the house regularly. And she had failed to notice that or failed to do anything about the fact that Alice wasn't keeping good records of the children that she had and seemed to be quite happy with the way things were going. 
So I really wanted to know more about these people. What I discovered was that Alice was a West Australian, um, the granddaughter of a pioneering family, the leaders who were the people who Leaderful was named after. She'd been a single mother herself twice and then married when she fell pregnant the third time. That marriage soon fell apart and then she came into a de facto relationship with someone she'd known since childhood and had four children with him. And then when that marriage or that relationship also fell apart, she took up running boarding houses in Perth. And I think that's where she met her third partner, Charles Mitchell, who was a, an African-American sailor who'd um, come to Australia several, several years earlier and was now working as a hairdresser. Dr. Officer, I discovered, had trained in Melbourne. He'd come to Perth in 1901 to set up a practice as a child health specialist. And he, I discovered to my surprise, was best known as one of the Victorian Football League's top players. He'd played for Essendon um, as a fullback, I think it was, not a football aficionado, but yeah, he was well known as a footballer before he came to Western Australia. Harriet Lenahan was probably the most surprising of the three. She was Irish. She was a child of Maurice Lenahan, who was the mayor of Limerick and also the editor of a Limerick newspaper. She'd come to Australia, to Melbourne in the 1880s, to hoping to get a job as a church organist. She had trained as a musician. She claimed at least to have gone through the Paris Conservatoire of Music and the London School of Music. But she didn't find a job as an organist. She finished up teaching music to children. And in the 1890s, when things became tough in Melbourne, she came across to Western Australia and continued to teach music to children. And then in 1901, she for some reason, which is not entirely explicable, she applied for the job of Perth's first female health inspector. Perth City Council was looking for a female health inspector to visit um, shops and places where women were working and also to supervise people who were um, taking in babies. So, by now, I, I was beginning to think that this was more than just a blog article. I was really fascinated by what I was learning about these three people. The other thing that really intrigued me was what I was learning about Perth at the time. I didn't realise that in 1901, um, Perth population, I think, of about 100,000. It had doubled over the time that the um, gold rushes had happened in the 1890s. But these services and infrastructure just hadn't kept up. And so most of the streets outside the city centre were unpaved. There was no sewage system, although it was being discussed constantly by city councils. And diseases like typhoid and smallpox and even bubonic plague went through regularly. The infant mortality rate in 1900 was roughly about one in 10, in other words, one in 10 babies didn't reach their first birthday because of infections, mostly sort of diarrhea type infections. Perth was also interesting in that during the um, 1890s, Western Australia gained um, self government and John Forrest had led the state through a lot of development, but he went off to Canberra in 1901 to take up federal politics and there was constant changes of government following that and a lot of nepotism and the um, pioneering families still had a lot of influence in Perth much to the chagrin of those who'd come later who felt that they were being excluded. The other thing that came through as I was learning more about the case was the role of the newspapers in Perth. There were several daily newspapers, um, 
and weekend newspapers as well. And then each town seemed to have a newspaper of its own, which was great for researching because it meant that I could compare one with another. And even though newspapers then were like newspapers now, they didn't always print the truth exactly. I could compare one with another. So that was, once I discovered all that information, I decided that this was a, a book length project and started writing. A lot of my information came from newspapers. As I say, there were, there were lots of um, newspapers about. And newspapers in those days used to print the reports of the files. Um, in great detail, almost word for word. So that gave me a lot of information. The other place that I um, found a lot of information was the State Records Office, um, which is sort of the library here in Perth. What I found surprising there was that I'd order something from the index and then discover when it came that the packet contained whole lot of information which I hadn't expected, which was really great. Um, one day I ordered Harriet Lenahan's um, probate record just to find out what was in there. And when it came, there was not just the probate record, but also her will. She'd written a will while she was in Perth before she went back to Ireland late in life. There were several letters between lawyers in, in Australia and Ireland as a result of discussing the will when she died. But the, um, the most incredible thing that I found, there was a letter that Harriet Lenahan had written when she first arrived in Western Australia. She wrote to someone in the education department asking for a job as a teacher. Um, could we show that letter? Tracy? Certainly, just bear with me and I will try and get that on the screen for you. So this is just the first page of the letter. I won't read it to you, but it gave me lots of details about where Harry should come from, what she'd done in the past, um, who her parents were, a whole lot of details that I wouldn't have got any other way. And it also gave me a very good indication of what sort of person she was. She was quite a character, really. She liked to blow her own trumpet and, um, and to drop names. The references that she used in the letter were um, the wife of the governor of New South Wales and Cardinal Newman, who was the head of the church, Catholic Church in England. I don't know what the person who received the letter thought about these references, but that was the person that she was. Um, thanks, Tracy. The great thing about the case being a Perth um, story was that I was able to do a lot of research on foot. In fact, my poor husband, every time he went for a walk, would find himself in some place where Alice Mitchell or after the Alice Mitchell story had taken place. One day we went down to the river for lunch and we just happened to be going past the Supreme Court as we were going back. So I pop in there because that was where Alice Mitchell's murder trial had taken place. And I was very fortunate that the, the, um, the officer there, when I told her what I was looking at, opened up courtroom two for me and showed me around and explained how things worked. And that was really great because it gave me a sense of, when I was writing about the trial, I had a really good sense of where it had taken place, what it looked like, how things functioned in that room. Um, the other thing that I did in order to get a sense of what things were like in 1907 when the trial took place was to collect pictures from particularly from the State Library. They've got a wonderful collection of old photos of Perth. And I discovered that in 1907, at the same time that the inquest into Ethel Booth was taking place, an entertainer named Leonard Corrick had made a 
three minute video or a film of the streets of Perth, he used to do this so that he could advertise the um, film be shown just before his um, group of entertainers put on their show and people would flock to see themselves on film because this was quite a novel idea. So could we just have a look at that video? This is just a small section from a three minute video and I'll get um, Tracy to show that if we can. Sorry, that's not the right one. That's not the right one, Tracy. Sure, just one moment. Sorry, my miss. That's it. This is great for seeing what people were wearing and what the streets looked like in 1907. Yeah, thank you. My apologies, it must have picked up the video that came yeah, after the next that one. one. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, as I say, I decided to write this story as a, a full length book. Um, one of the first things though that I had to answer for myself was, should I write it? I knew that there were descendants of the people involved in the trial still living in Perth and what were the ethics of writing about somebody else's family history? I decided in the end, well, first of all, that no history would ever get written if you couldn't write about a story where there were still living. But also, um, I wasn't going to be revealing anything from secret diaries or anything that wasn't in the public record. And I was also guided by the fact that when I'd written my biography of my great great grandmother that was a fairly warts and all sort of history but it had been well received by people who'd read it who were descended from Susan so I decided that provided that I was fair and not judgmental I wrote a decent you know a good balanced story about the people involved it was reasonable to go ahead with that the next um question I needed to answer. When I'd written the first draft, I'd written pretty much what happened in chronological order. But um, it meant that most of the book was taken up with the trial and people's testimony at the trial, their evidence. And that made a rather long, fairly tedious sort of structure. And so I decided to take some of the evidence, take it out of the trial and use it to create the story beforehand without changing any of the facts, but just putting it before rather than during the trial. So I'll just give you an example of that. Um, this is from chapter eight and it's from the police evidence at the inquest, I think it was. But as I say, I've, I've brought it forward to before Alice Mitchell was arrested. Police Constable Calmsey reached the railway line that marked the southern end of his beat and paused for a moment. In the distance, he could hear trains shunting in the railway yards and the whistle and whoosh of steam being released as the 9.30 p.m. train left Perth Central Station for Fremantle. On a Monday night, its carriages would be almost empty. The day, February 4th, 1907, had been quite mild by Perth summer standards, but the sea breeze from the west had dropped now and the air was still. 
The stench from the nearby Claysbrook drain soon made him eager to continue his walk back towards the station at Highgate Hill. The previous week, workers from the city council had dredged the drain. After skimming off the surface scum, they'd removed a stinking mass of rags, papers, decomposing animal carcasses and rotting vegetation. They caught and killed six rats, but a myriad more had gone scurrying into the surrounding area. And this is what came from the evidence at the trial. Constable Calmsey turned northwest into Edward Street, heading back towards the police station. He hadn't gone far when he heard a shout. Officer, my wife would like a word with you. Even in the dark, the constable recognized the voice. Charles Mitchell was well known around the town as an affable American hairdresser who ran a small news agency and tobacco shop. He was also a black man married to a white woman, a novelty in Perth and of course for gossip. Constable Calmsey approached the gate of number 24. A woman appeared at the door of the cottage and came to meet him. She wore her hair pulled back into a loose knot on top of her head. In the dim light from the house, the wire-rimmed glasses on her nose seemed to enhance the angularity of her face. This was Alice Mitchell. How can I help, he asked. I need you to find the mother of a child for me, she said. I've been looking after her child for some time, but lately she hasn't contributed anything to my expenses. I haven't been able to find her and the child is in a bad way. If she's sick, why don't you send for the doctor, asked the constable. How can I do that, she demanded. I can't afford to pay the doctor's fee or pay for medicine for her. Constable Calmsey thought for a moment. In that case, you should take her to Mr Rowe, the police magistrate, first thing in the morning. He can relieve you of responsibility for the child. I don't have time to do that. I have other children to care for. Who will look after them? If you've taken on the care of this infant, it's your responsibility to look after it, said the constable. Alice Mitchell shook her head. You don't know anything about it, she said. So, as I say, that conversation was actually part of the evidence of the trial. The other thing I had to say when I was writing the book was what to leave out. I got a lot of information that um, is hard to let go when you've spent maybe hours or even days trying to find it. At one stage, I had a long history of Western Australia at the beginning of the book and my daughter, Amy, who edited the first few drafts for me, pointed out that, well, it was interesting, but it wasn't really relevant. So most of that had to go or I could incorporate it somewhere else rather than having a long, long chapter of history. The final thing I needed to decide, particularly as I got towards the end of editing and writing it was, what was the significance of the story? Why should anybody read it? For West Australians, the trial was important because the child protection laws were changed as a result of it. In fact, the state government had drafted laws and put them into practice almost as soon as the trial finished. They changed the laws about who could apply for it are licensed to take in children. They, um, instead of having health inspectors inspecting the houses, they brought in trained nurses to do that. They also introduced a, um, a children's department as a department of the government, and they introduced a children's court. So having been well behind the other states in child protection before the trial, they were now fairly cutting edge. The significance outside Western Australia is perhaps that it demonstrates that no matter how many rules and safeguards and regulations you have, if, if people are not taking responsibility for making sure that they're carried out, then people like Alice Mitchell can do what they like. At the trial, the judge reprimanded Dr. Officer and um, Harriet Lenahan, and Harriet Lenahan actually lost her job as a result. But um, in, in real terms, there was already legislation that should have protected the children in Alice Mitchell's care, but they hadn't taken responsibility for it. They both assumed that the other 
was in some way responsible. And the other thing I, I realized as I was coming towards the end of editing the book was the similarities between the story of these illegitimate children and other people throughout history and in the present as well who have been labeled illegal and not part of the, the community which means that they can be hidden away and taken advantage of and um, exploited. So um, I think I'll leave it there and I'll open up for questions. That's okay, Tracy. Of course it is, yeah. Thank you, Stella. Um, I'm just waiting for some questions to come in. So please um, feel free to type anything uh, into your chat or Q&A fields and I can um, ask those questions to Stella. Ray does say um, she hopes your book is available at Crows in Vic Park, WA, because she'll be there later today and wants to purchase one. So that's great. I'm sure it is, Ray. Um, you can also buy uh, Stella's book directly from the publisher, Fremantle Press, at www.fremantlepress.com.au. So I'd like to know, Stella, actually personally, um, how long it took you to write the book and are you working on anything else, another book? Um, it took me about two years to write and then it's been through the editing process, you know, through the publishing process, it's been about 18 months. In fact, <laughs> I found that quite strange having self-published a book where you just upload a file to Amazon and press publish when I was told by um, Fremantle Press that it would take 18 months, that <laughs> seemed very strange. But now that I've been through the process, I understand why, why that's the case. Um, in terms of another book, yes, I have started. I've done the research to get going on a book set in the 1890s in Western Australia. Um, I won't say more than that at the moment. Oh, I was hoping for a little hint, but anyway, that's okay. Um, there won't you... be there won't be any bad women or. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and Ray also says she loves history, and you've given me many tips in the writing of her father's family history. So that's great. That's good. Um, and what was your usual writing routine while uh, finishing the Edward Street Baby Farm? I tried to sit down at nine o'clock every morning and um, write maybe a thousand words, 500, a thousand words. I didn't always manage that. I had a little um, sticker on my computer that said, um, just trying to remember what it said. <laughs> it reminded me that I wasn't, I didn't need to finish it today. I just need to get started, so. Um, Excellent. And did you come across any specific challenges in writing the book? And is there anything you'd do uh, differently writing your next book? Um, no, as I say, perhaps the fact that I was writing about people who had living descendants and how would they feel about having all this exposed again? Um, I think it had been forgotten most people so there was that side of things um like I say my poor husband every time I open my eyes I'd say oh I've just been thinking about the book <laughs> what do you think about this and what do you think about that um I think because I had a medical background I could understand the medical details that came up during the trial and I had to make sure that I didn't assume that everybody else would understand them. So it was putting those into everyday language. Um, yeah. Great, and, yeah. Um, I'm a great fan of Eric Larson and Kate Summerscale who take history and write you know, really good stories. And so, I wanted to do something like that. I didn't want to just have this happened and then that happened. I wanted to write it in a way that you know really flowed. And so I read quite a few books on writing fiction to work out how to plot 
story and um, develop characters, even though the details were fixed because I was writing a non-fiction. But there were still opportunities to decide what to leave in, what to leave out and how to guess it. Yeah, I guess there was so much information, it would have been hard to work out what to include and not to include to, you know, bring people's attention to this story that, like you said, a lot of people may have forgotten about. The other challenge since it's been published is that it sounds silly, but when I was writing it, I hadn't thought of it as true crime because I felt as though I was writing biography, the biography of the three people involved, Alice Mitchell, Dr. Officer and Harriet Lenahan. So yeah, I've got I've had to get used to the idea that it's um, classified as true crime. Yeah, we were only talking about your webinar yesterday in the office and we were referring to it as true crime. So well that's that's how it's built. Yeah. Um Mary Ann says uh, she's heard about tomato box tomato box babies. She thinks in the USA. Did you read about this in your research? No, I haven't come across that term. Has she said what tomato box babies are? No, she hasn't, but I'm going to have to Google that now. I'm very curious myself. Hmm. Uh, Claire, she says the term baby farming, it comes up in one of the Gilbert and Sullivan's operas, Pirates, she thinks. So it's interesting that it was happening in Australia. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the most notorious cases were in Britain. There was um, a woman called... Alice Dyer, who was responsible for the deaths of maybe hundreds of babies. She, she quite deliberately strangled them, dumped them in the river um, because she was taking a lump sum fee for taking them on. Um, the famous case in, in Australia with the Makins in Sydney in the 1890s, they, um, they were found out because plumbers digging up a garden um, discovered some bodies, babies' bodies buried in the backyard and they were traced to this couple called the Makins. He was hanged and she was sent to prison for the rest of her life. But, I mean, the practice was pretty widespread. Um, even at the time of Alice Mitchell, there were other people tried for neglecting children or causing the death of one child. Mm, it's awful. Um, Paula says, looking at this with today's eyes, what Alice Mitchell did is deplorable, but how much fault do you place on Perth Council at the time? The lack of social services, the lack of waste management, leading to poor health conditions and the death of so many babies, thereby perhaps making infant deaths seem more acceptable. And she also says, thank you. The book, it's very fascinating. And thanks for doing so much in-depth research. Thank you. Um, Yes, what I've tried to bring out in the book is that whereas the trial was presented as a great sensation and Alice Mitchell was portrayed as a, a baby killer, um, there were a lot of other factors involved, including the fact, as I say, that Dr Officer hadn't reported the high death rate and Harriet Lenahan, the health inspector, um, doesn't seem to have taken her role. Seriously enough, she was assuming that because doctor officer was seeing the babies, um, everything must be okay. And that, that's a question in itself. I mean, if Alice Mitchell was calling in the doctor when the babies were sick, um, how, <laughs> how much intentional malice was involved there? Um, the, yeah, the conditions at the time were pretty bad. Even for the, you know, even for children in normal families, the death rate was very high. Uh, I think something like one in seven children died before the age of five in the early 1900s. In fact, at the trial, the um, one of the jury, or well, I think it was the head of the jury, pointed out to the judge that, you know, his children had got sick with the same sort of things that Alice Mitchell's children seemed to have suffered from the same sort of diseases. So he couldn't really understand what the, what the issue was. Um, 
Yeah. As I said, um, sorry, go on. Because ahead. because Perth's population had grown so quickly over the previous ten years, it was it was just not coping with the number of people and not keeping up with sewage and healthcare and so on. There was only one hospital in Perth at the time. Well, one public hospital. There were a few private hospitals. Mm, seems like it was um, the same in most of the major cities in Australia around that time, yeah. that they couldn't ca keep up. Um, Mary Ann's just popped a comment about those tomato box babies in the Q&A. So she says it was a similar situation where a woman took in single mothers, let the babies die from malnutrition and then buried them in tomato boxes. And right. the mothers were then made to continue on at the home as servants to pay off their debts. Right. Um, Ray asks, did you run your manuscript past the family to get their approval or their thoughts? Um, no, not the manuscript as a whole. I did have um, some interaction with one of Alice Mitchell's descendants who had already discovered the story for herself. Um, and when I mentioned that in the book, I sent her what I was going to write so that she would approve or not of what I was saying about our particular interactions. But no, I didn't correspond with any of the families. Great. Well, that's all the um, questions we have this morning. Stella, I think everybody's a bit shy or whether they've you answered everything through your talk. So um, did you have anything else you wanted to share about the book before we leave you this morning? Um, no, I think I've covered most of what I plan to say. Um, yeah, excellent. It's been great. Uh, fascinating. Um, you know, it seems like such a well-researched, well-written account of such a notorious criminal and also about the social history of Perth. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and thanks also for telling us about your first book, Susan. Um, I'll have to go and look that one up as well. So thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, there's quite a bit about Adelaide. In yeah. Oh, great. We'll definitely go and look that one up. Um, thank you so much, Stella, for joining us all the way from Western Australia this morning. Um, as I said earlier, Stella's book can be purchased directly from the publisher, Fremantle Press, at www.fremantlepress.com.au or at any local bookshop or good local bookshop so please keep following the marion library's facebook page the city of marion website and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming library through the lens presentations and workshops and if you haven't already registered please join us on tuesday the 16th of march as we welcome author julie sprig to talk about her heartfelt memoir small steps a physio in ethiopia so thank you again stella thank you and uh, we hope you will join us next time thank you everyone Thank you.